Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Rejoice. Pastor Reckley mentioned that this Sunday, historically, in the past, has had a couple different names. One of the names is Rejoice Sunday, the Latin word litara. Might not seem very surprising. Rejoice is a word and a concept that comes up often enough in Scripture. But consider the context and the timing of this Sunday. We're in the middle of Lent. And Lent is a season that is usually more subdued, right? We take away the song of praise at the beginning of the liturgy. and We don't speak that, that word of praise. This is a time when we talk more about sin and repentance. It's a time when we hear more in depth about Jesus' suffering. Rejoice! <laughs> it seems a little out of place. But the design of, of this Sunday was to have, right in the middle of Lent, a break, a break from the heaviness, like a, like a little oasis, a chance to rest and be refreshed before finishing the journey to Good Friday. I, you might picture a couple of guys putting a roof on a new house on a hot day in the summer. Right? By mid-afternoon, they're exhausted. They're so hot, they're so tired, and so they come down, they sit in the shade, and they, they drink a cold glass of water, they sit there for a while, and then after several minutes, they stand up and announce with determination, all right, let's get back up there, let's finish it. They're refreshed to go on. It's probably likely that it's not so much Lent that you need a rest from, but life. Right? The heaviness of life, the anxieties, the chaos, well, if that's the case, this Sunday serves the same purpose for you, too. It's time to rest today and to be refreshed so, so that we can get back out there and keep going. And God himself invites you to come to him for rest. Jesus' invitation to rest in Matthew chapter 11 is probably the most well-known. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Well, today we get to look at another invitation from God to rest and to be refreshed. This one comes from Isaiah chapter 55, the first three verses. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David." So today, on a little bit of a dreary morning, let's take this time to rest and to be refreshed to carry on, both with Lent and with life. There's reason to rejoice, even during Lent and even when you're fatigued by life. Isaiah tells us here that, that we have reason to rejoice because God is a lousy businessman. What does that have to do with anything? Well, let's, let's find out. Come and get it. That might make you think of mom, like calling the scattered family to come because the food is ready. But these verses in Isaiah 55 actually intend to paint a different scene in our minds. The scene is that of a marketplace, an outdoor market with, with vendors lined up along the streets, each with their table or, or booth. And... and Behind each table, behind each booth, the vendor is calling out to the people who are walking by, trying to get them over to their table, trying to lure them over so that they will buy what, what he has to offer. God is like one of those vendors, calling out to us. And although I said he's a lousy businessman, he actually starts out very well. He, he shouts out his invitation, "'Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters.'" 
He starts out well because he does what, what most commercials and advertisements still do today. Right? He points out a need and then promises that what he has will fill that need. You're thirsty. I have water. Come and get it. Yeah, that's what commercials do, right? You have stains. We have the stain remover that will take them away. You have this, this need to, to get away and feel free. This car is going to allow you to do just that. Or you need to go and have a good time. We have the beer that will make that happen. At least these commercials try to convince you that you have a need. A lot of times they're just making it up. Many times what they're selling is not really something that you need. They just want you to think that you need it. But God is not like that. God is not trying to trick you into something. Because God knows exactly what you need. We sing in that hymn, I am Jesus' little lamb, that, that he knows my need and well provides me. God knows that people thirst. We're not talking about physical thirst, of course. We're talking about that deeper longing for something. A deeper longing to be satisfied somehow and to be filled. That, that need to, to get a break and to rest and to be refreshed from life. God knows that you need that because... Because he knows the things that go on in your life. He knows the things that you fight with in your mind. He knows how sometimes life can start running away without you. He knows that it's a constant struggle to be happy with yourself and to get along with other people. He knows all these things that, that wear you down because he knows you personally. And so he invites you to come to him to quench your thirst and to get what you truly need. See, as a vendor, he does. He starts out very well by pointing out your need and, and making an attractive promise to fulfill it. But, but as God keeps calling, we start to question his strategy as a businessman. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Normally, a vendor would target not only people who need what he has to sell, but people who have the money to buy it. Otherwise, what good does it do the vendor? But God does the opposite. He's calling out to people who are broke, people who can't afford what he has to offer. And that, that, that seems pointless. How can they buy something if they don't have any money? Well, God goes on, come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And now we really have to raise an eyebrow and question God's business sense. Buy without money and without cost. That's, that's silly. What vendor would do that? You don't make any money that way. You get nothing in return. That's, that's not buying and selling. That's just giving stuff away. And that's exactly right. It's just giving stuff away. God may be a lousy businessman, but he is a remarkable humanitarian. He has exactly what humanity needs. And he just wants to give it away. See, God's not a businessman at all. He's not looking to gain anything from the transaction. He's not looking to make money. He just wants to give. That's what our God is like. That's, it's called grace. And so he calls out, come, come and get it. Come and rest. Come and be refreshed. Come get what you truly need. Well, what is that? Get what? We mentioned water already, water to quench thirst, but, but God also says, come and get wine and milk. These are two drinks that are mentioned a lot of times in the Old Testament, and almost always there's an idea or a concept behind them. It's, it's more of a picture than, than literal. Wine has the idea of joy. True joy, joy in life. And, and milk has the idea of richness in life, right? Milk is, has fat in it. It's more filling than water is, and so it satisfies. Just like the land of Canaan is called the land flowing with milk and honey, it was a rich land. It would satisfy their needs. So God calls out to you and he promises some things for your life. He promises that you will find a, a way to quench your thirst with his water. He promises that you will be refreshed from the drudgery of your life by receiving the joy that he gives. 
He promises that, that you can take a break from the emptiness of, of life by receiving the fullness that, that he provides, the milk. And he promises that these things will be able to refresh you and energize you so that you can walk out of here and you can get back to it and you can continue your journey. Come and get it, especially because it's free. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? How, how foolish would it be for somebody who's hungry and thirsty to go to the vendor next to God and to spend all sorts of money on souvenir shot glasses and then complain that he's still thirsty? He spent his money on the wrong thing. But that's really what we do when we think that we'll be happier by shelling out all this money for gadgets and luxuries. It's exactly what we do when we, we think we'll be more fulfilled when we spend more time on sports or personal appearance and self-improvement. It's, it's exactly what we do when we think we'll be satisfied by chasing worldly dreams or, or giving in to that nagging temptation. These things don't fulfill or satisfy. These are all things that are not bread. And they just add busyness and stress to our life. And all the while, God is still here calling out to you from his booth. Come and get it. He simply offers you rest and refreshment and that which truly satisfies. And he does it to you by offering Jesus. See, Jesus is the fulfillment of these words in Isaiah 55. There's a verse in the New Testament that says, All of God's promises are yes in Jesus which means everything that, that, every good thing that God promises you comes your way through Jesus. Jesus or God promise you re, promises you rest and refreshment. Jesus gives that to you because he washes away the guilty conscience with his blood. And though you may feel like you have nothing to offer God, no way to earn God's favor, and you're right, God provides Jesus who with his life earned God's favor for you and put you in a good spot with God. Jesus gives you a break by, by caring for you rather than you always constantly having to care for other people. He gives you that break. And God promises, he promises that you will find rest and refreshment and reason to rejoice in Jesus. Trust him. That's what he promises. So where do we get this rest? Where do we get Jesus? God goes on. Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Just listen to the vendor and by listening to him you will be receiving what he has to offer you. See, the words of God are the feast that satisfies us. The words of God are what we digest through our ears and his words are the cold water that quenches thirst. His words are the, the milk and the wine that gives us joy and pro provides fulfillment and nourishment. His words are the rest that we need. His words are what gets us ready to get back out there and continue on with life because his words bring us Jesus. As we walk past God's booth or listen to his call, it's human nature to be skeptical. To hear what God promises, you know, just by listening to him and to doubt if whether it will really happen or not. That's, that's human nature. We're used to being skeptical of claims, of commercials and advertisements because they usually do exaggerate. But this is God making a promise about what his words can accomplish in your life. And God has been in a habit of keeping all of his promises, totally, with his whole being. Trust him. Come and get it. Be refreshed. Get your break by listening to the words of God. God may be a lousy businessman, but he is a remarkable humanitarian. Without expecting, 
you to do anything without demanding any payment or pledge. God simply offers you his goods and offers you rest. And then he promises, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love that was promised to David. God promises you the same love that he promised to King David. He promises to view you and to treat you the same way that he viewed and treated David, the man after his own heart. He promises to treat you with a love that lasts forever. That's his agreement with you. And that's reason to rejoice, even today. Amen.